right, team, here we are. It's week six. We've finished our work on steel. And now we're going to move on to our next material. So the thing to remember with this is it's the exact same thing we just did two weeks doing with steel. Now we're going to do it with wood. So there's not really that much new information. It's just about the material that we're learning new. Um, my, I hope you guys all had a, a great spring break. I had been hoping my beautiful dream and goal had been to get ahead a week so that you guys always had like an extra week to watch each video. I had these grand dreams of it uh, and it did not happen. So here we are still filming down to the wire in the day I have to post. So um, <clears throat> we're going to go through wood today. We're going to keep it simple and focus on uh, wood columns the same way we did in the first week of steel. But we have a lot more material information because wood's a little bit different. It's organic, uh, it has all kinds of weird things happening in it. Um, it's not the same in every way, in every direction. So if there's more that we have to think about when we make our design equations or when the really smart engineers in the past made up these design equations. But we have to be smart about how we use them and have an idea of where they come from and what they're trying to achieve before we can make use of these equations. I have uploaded your project outline. Uh, so it lists everything you need to do for me. Um, and remember, there are two parts to your project. There is the make a set of structural drawings of your uh, comprehensive studio course. Um, and there are guidelines there for if your partner's not in the class, if you're a solo person, um, all kinds of kind of criteria built into that. So you just have to take the time and read the syllabus. All the information should be there for you. And then part two that everyone has to do, you've been assigned some members for an imaginary project that I have given you a set of structural drawings for. And you have to design those. Now, all of the members are in steel, so you already have the ability to do that portion if you want to. So you have the ability now to go ahead and do a good chunk of your final project if you feel like it. There's no rush, it's not due until April 30th, but it is there and available for you to get a good long uh, head start on it. Um, with the, um, the first part of your project, which is making structural drawings of your comprehensive studio, uh, the big thing that people often ask is they've been working on their structural drawings and then they make a pretty large design change, you know, two days before uh, studio reviews. Um, and they panic thinking they now have to go back and update all their structural. I am not going to go and cross-reference with what your final studio submittal is. So if you want to pick a date that you produce your structural drawings from, I am okay with that. I am not going to go cross-reference it. You should give me any renderings or images that allow me to reference the structural drawings you provided. So if you make massive changes and you change all your renderings and it makes no sense now with your structural drawings, that could be a problem. Uh, so you might want to use the renderings from like a step before that's not going to add confusion. Remember, I'm not in your head. I don't know what you were trying to do. And in a normal circumstance, the point of these drawings is to tell someone how to build the building. So remember that that's the point here. So you need to be able to tell someone how to put this building together. And that's what we're trying to achieve. So let's start with some information about wood. Um, some of it, I'm not really going to test you much on. There's a few questions on the assignment. Um, you have the slides available. They're not complex kind of uh, uh, ideas. I'm not, you don't have to learn how to manage a forest or anything like that. Um, but we are just going to touch on some of the basics that help fuel the wood industry, which, let's face it, is the kind of game changer in the market right now going through a bit of a blip because it's so popular and supply went down. I have a project right now uh, where um, they put in uh, a price for $100,000 and they're now asking for $200,000 extra, so a total of $300,000 uh, 
uh, because the cost of lumber has gone up so drastically in the past year. Um, so this is one of those rare times where there's a kind of a massive market fluctuation that people couldn't have anticipated. Hardwood softwood. Most people have tossed that term around. Um, you know that hardwoods are usually deciduous trees, so that means the leafy ones, uh, where the leaves fall down at the end of the growing season. And softwoods are usually coniferous trees. There's obviously always rule, all of these hard rules always have exceptions, but these are a good kind of idea to have behind it. Um, so coniferous trees are the cone-bearing trees that have needles as leaves. Um, most coniferous trees keep those leaves or the needles throughout the winter, so you'll often herd them um, called evergreens as well. In Canada, most of the lumber and wood products come from softwoods because we can grow them quickly and manage them easily. Uh, poplar and aspen are becoming more popular for LVLs and PSLs because they grow straight and quick as well as the softwoods, even though they're a hardwood. It's not to say that hardwoods don't make magnificent lumber. It's that they have a longer uh, growing life um, and they're slightly harder to manage in our managed forests. And we've cut down all the old ones. So the structural wood is the wood that we care about because that's what we're trying to build with. So there are 30 common softwoods, about 30 common softwoods in Canada, um, but four of them tend to be the ones we use in construction. Obviously, there's always change, there's always exceptions to every rule, but for the most part, we use spruce to make our dimensional lumber. So that's our two by fours, two by sixes, two by twelves, four by fours, uh, for residential and light framing. Pine is often used for trim work, although it can be used structurally as well. Cedar is really popular for decks and exterior applications. It inherently resists some of the, uh, the, the, the downfalls of being outside for exposed lumber. So it has natural properties that make it really good in those applications. And then Douglas fir tends to be used for construction. So that would be making our glue limb. CLT often still uses spruce to build up the panels, even though, so mass timber, and uh, we used to think of as being glue lamb, uh, but now we have CLT in the mix, and it tends to not be made with Douglas fir. It could be, but it is often used with spruce. So here's just a little chart on how we name or group the types of lumber or wood materials um, to kind of give a classification of our wood property groups. Because all of these trees have slightly different properties, we've grouped them into groupings of ones that are very similar and have similar applications. So you can, oh nerds, I need to change my mouse here for you guys. And my screen, let me just find my mouse adjuster here. Let me see if I can do it the long way because my shortcut is missing at the moment. Mm. Sorry guys, I have to escape this. You just have to bear with me here for but a moment. Here we go, slideshow, current slide, swap, all right. So now you can still not see my mouse. What? There, now you can see my mouse. So you can see here, abbreviations used in the manual. So the manual we're talking about is everything we use to design wood. Douglas fir larch, or DFL, or D for L. 
Uh, so that tends to include our Douglas fir and our Western larch. I said that we use Douglas fir often for making glue lamp. So that's a handy one to know. Hem fir uh, is Pacific hemlock uh, and uh, this particular fir. I have rarely designed with this. Um, I've used, we've used hemlock for docks because it resists um, moisture really well. The big one that we use the most is right here, or SPF, spruce pine fir. So that is the majority of what we're going to be designing with. That said, northern species, or nor or north, includes cedar. So that one's handy if we're trying to design cedar. Remember, cedar's really great for outdoor applications, your decks, um, uh, you know, feature elements outside, we like to use cedar. Or else we'll do something to treat our SPF. Um, so those of you who have built a deck know that you might choose to use um, pressure treated lumber. So that would be SPF with a treatment, or you might go for cedar. Um, cedar is more expensive, uh, so with the rising costs of lumber, I, I always used to prefer to use cedar, uh, but now if I'm building something outside, I'll often switch to pressure tree SPF. So a cross section of a tree. You guys have probably all heard that you can tell the age of a tree by its rings. That is not a lie, it is true. Uh, you can count the age of a tree. So Maybe a little bit blurry, it might not be exact, but it's a pretty good way to figure out the age of a tree. Um, we have the bark out here, inner bark. These are not things that you really need to know that much of. Um, the things I really want to point out is the sapwood and the heartwood. Um, so in here we have uh, the wood that's not really doing much of the growth anymore. All of the sap and all of the moisture going up and down the tree is happening out here. Um, see these lines, these pits and rays kind of going across the rings? Um, those you could imagine if we're trying to make a piece of lumber out of right here, those little checks and rays are going to have an impact on our lumber. Uh, so this is the effect of the natural properties of the wood. Uh, in the spring, the tree grows really fast and we get a lot of really large cellular structure in our tree growth. And then over the summer, it heats up and it slows down a little bit and the cells get tighter and tighter and tighter. And then it basically stops over the winter. And then spring hits and we get another massive boom of growth. So just to show you that kind of on a cellular level, here is the cell structure of a ring of a tree. So here's one annual ring. You can see that the spring wood, those cells, are very large. And in the summer, they started to tighten up. As you can see as well, this looks like a bundle of straws clipped together. Now you can imagine if you take that handful of straws and push on it this way, versus pushing on it this way, it's going to behave in a very different way. So that means that our material is not isotropic. If you guys remember with our seal, I said it acts the same in every direction from a material property. Buckling isn't a material property. That's about slenderness. But from a material property standpoint, wood is different in each direction. So that's gonna add some complexity to our design. Now, this is stuff I've shown you in the past, but I'm going to give a quick refresher because I know there are five or six students that weren't in Structures 1. The idea there is that you're supposed to know all this, but they never really tell me that or tell you that. So here's just a quick kind of refresher. Um, we don't have time to go too in-depth in it, in it, so ask your friends if any of this doesn't sound familiar. But here's a quick refresher on it. Dimensional or nominal lumber. So this is our two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens, two by twelves, a four by four, maybe even a six by six. This is what we use for joists and studs in a building. We might use it as a beam. Often we'll make built up beams where we take a few of those plies, so a ply is a single one, and screw them together to make a bigger element. Um, posts would be when we're using it as a column, as in it's at least a 4x4, four four. or we'll do a built-up post where we uh, take maybe two 
two by fours or two two by sixes or more and screw them together. Now, this is the thing for those that haven't um, uh, done much with wood before. We talked about it last term, so all of you that did structures one should know this. A two by four, which means two inches by four inches, isn't really two inches by four inches. It is one and a half by three and a half inches. It's been milled down or it's been planed down. It's had the rough edges taken off of it. You can get rough sawn lumber that has not been planed down to these sizes. It's got rough edges, so if you rub up against it, you're gonna stick your clothes on it. It's got sharper edges. Um, it's got sharper corners on it. I have gone to a mill directly and purchased that lumber for building a dock, uh, but it's a little bit harder to find. You have to go out of your way to get it. This is all the material you can walk into Home Depot and find. Plywood, we're not really going to get into the design of it right now, but this is more just to give you a refresher on uh, what it is. Do they need more snap? No. Uh, they won't eat it? Sometimes they get mad if I cut it and insist on a whole apple. <laughs> I've been there. I tried to plan. I was throwing a curveball. We bought, they'll go through a period where they'll eat like three bananas a day. And so I'll buy like pounds of bananas. And now I have them rotting away on my counter. But Dave gets lots of banana bread, so he's happy for that. So plywood, um, we're not going to be doing anything with the design of it, but it's helpful to know what we're doing with it. It provides our surface, whether it's a wall, or a floor. We put it on top of our joists or we put it against our studs and screw it or nail it in. So this would be our surface. Now this is going to be handy to just have in the back of our mind when we talk about system effects on an element. Don't worry, we're going to get to that in about 10 slides. Um, I joists, again, we're not going to be designing these, but I just wanted to remind you that it exists. We talked about this all in Structures 1. Uh, this would replace a regular wood joist. These are uh, designed by the manufacturer, but the base building engineer would often go through and do a quick sizing to just let the team know if what we're using or what we want to use seems in the realm of normal. Uh, PSL and LVL are engineered members that we would use in the context of uh, residential framing or the smaller scale of framing. They perform slightly better than our built-up beams. Remember those plies of 2x4s or 2x6s all the way up to 2x12s screwed together. Uh, you can make plies of this, you can make built-up members of this as well. So PSL is parallel strand lumber and LVL is laminated veneer lumber. We're not going to be doing the calculations on these, but I just want to refresh you in the nomenclature. And then glue lamb. Uh, glue lamb, we can do beams, posts, we can curve it. It is essentially a series of two by fours or two by sixes stacked on top of each other and then infused in with glue to make them act as one thing. The gluing together is very, very, very important. So important, in fact, that in two lectures, we're going to spend an entire lecture talking about what it means to make something composite, which means instead of it being just a series of elements stacked on top of each other, the gluing them together makes it act as one big member. And how does that make a difference in our design? And we're going to talk about that in two weeks. And then CLT, the most popular thing to talk about in engineering and architecture these days, it's basically uh, large scale plywood where we take a series of two by fours or two by sixes and lay them side by side. And then in the other direction, lay them side by side, hi buddy, and then take another series of them and put them that way and then glue them together. But we just glue them down together. I just found out the other day that we don't actually glue in the seams here. They're just glued at the surface. There are some brands or some companies that will glue those joints, but we don't often joint glue uh, uh, those pieces of wood together. So that was just a quick refresher of all of the stuff we talked about wood before. Remember, that was an entire lecture last term. 
if any of you um, want access to that and don't, feel free to email me. Uh, I will gladly share all the information from Structures One with anyone who wants it. You just have to let me know. Um, so wood, as I said, is different than steel. Steel, we go into a plant and we have a chemist mix things together, heat it up, melt it down, and then let it cool. And it gets tested, um, and it's very, very, very precise. It behaves the same in every direction. Wood, we go into the woods and take a chainsaw and cut down an organic piece of material and expect to know how it's going to behave structurally. You can imagine two trees standing right side by side are going to have slightly different characteristics. So how do we quantify that? So here are the things about wood we need to worry about when we're doing our design. Wood has moisture. Remember, sap, if anyone's ever enjoyed delicious, delicious maple syrup, you know that in that kind of sap layer of the wood, that's where the moisture is moving up and down the tree. That moisture is in there when we cut the tree down. So we have to do something to think about that moisture. We definitely dry it some, um, but even after we've dried it before we build with it, there is some moisture still left in it. Wood shrinks. You saw all of those cells kind of uh, uh, together there. You can imagine that those will shrink up a little bit as we lose that moisture. So wood shrinks. As I've said, wood is non-isotropic. Isotropic means the same in every direction. So if I took, my kids have stolen my eraser, I found my eraser. If I take this rubber, it's the same as steel. The material properties in this direction are the same as the material properties in this direction. And if, except for buckling, they're the same in this direction. I mean, it does try to buckle, but if I just braced it, the material properties are the same in all three directions. Wood is not. You saw the cellular makeup of that. It's like a long series of straws side by side. So how it behaves when you squeeze it this way is going to behave different from how it when you squeeze that way. So we have to build that into our design. Wood's not perfect. There are imperfections in wood. Um, I wish... Here. Right there, you can see a knot in that wood. The wood looks different right there. So we have everywhere um, a branch comes into our tree, we have imperfections in our wood. So we have to account for that. Wood creeps. So that means slowly, over time, wood will deform in some way. So this is slightly different than our elastic versus plastic behavior. It will slowly, over time, take on a deformated, a deformed shape um, while it's been loaded. Wood rots or gets eaten. So in the right moisture drying cycle, wood can rot away because it is organic. Bugs like to eat wood. Termites, there are ants that like to eat wood. So we have to count for that as well. And then the big one that people think about is wood burns. It is um, not non-combustible. It is combustible. So we have to take into account the fact that wood can burn or else do something to it to prevent it from burning. So those are all the things we're worried about when we design with wood. So we have to figure out a way to take all of these things into account that we didn't have in our steel design. So. But in essence, the way we design a wood column is exactly the same as we design a steel column, except we have to build all of this in. So we have cross-sectional area, trying to squash it, and then if it's tall, it's trying to buckle, all of that is going to stay the same, except we have to add in all of these things, all of these things about wood. So here's how we do it. We, 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 the scientists, the very smart people, the people that have written this wonderful book right here, 
have created factors for us to allow us to be able to um, group and classify and talk about this wood in kind of groupings and sections. So we have to know what species of wood we're using. We have to know what grade of wood we're using. Is it um, wood that's got lots of knots in it, not very many knots in it? We have to know how big it is. So we have a size factor. As it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the odds of us not being able to see a flaw in it because it's inside the middle of it get greater. System effects. System effects are great for us. System effects help us out, and I'll talk about those when I get to that slide. Um, load duration. So that's about the fact that our wood creeps. So if we have a load on it for a long time, it will slowly start to creep. So we have to think, we have to, we have a factor for that. So service conditions, wet or dry. So that was the, it can rot um, uh, and it can be eaten classification. So there, is it out in the water? Well, we have to build that into our design. Chemicals, so we can have preservatives to help prevent rotting uh, and we can put fire retardants on it. And then, this is the same one, this, the only one out of all of these we worried about with steel was lateral stability or buckling. So we're still going to have to worry about that. Remember we had that lambda factor that we added into our compression design in steel columns? Well, we're going to have something similar in our wood design right here. So I'm not going to test you on any of this, but I find people get a little bit confused about what wood construction actually looks like, how it goes together. So this is just a little reminder that these are our joists. We've got plywood subfloor going across it. Here are our studs making up our walls. Maybe we've got a rafter or a truss. Here's a beam. Uh, here's, here's a ledger on a concrete wall. Again, I'm not testing you on these. These are just... People, um, there's all kinds of different names for things in uh, wood construction and how they go together. Um, you guys were, people got annoyed in steel or even in basic wood when I talked about purlins, joists, beams, and girders. Well, there's actually even more terminology than that. You can have a header, or you can have a jack, you can have a joist, a trimmer, um, you can have a stringer. Those were all, except for the jack, those were all terms for beams. Just different types of beams and basically where they fit in the building of our house. Definitely not things I'm going to test you on, but I wanted you to have reference to it because there are going to be times people are going to say those words and it would be nice for you to be able to go back and see something that lets you understand what they're talking about. All right, let's start talking about all of those factors and I'll break it down factor by factor. And guess what? These wonderful people have provided tables for us for every single one of those things. So the very first one is what is our lumber grade? Now, this one isn't much use to you until I actually ask you a question. Here are the grades right here and here's the grade category right here. So you have to know what job the element is doing, and you have to have an idea of what material is available to do it. Now, I will make that as easy as possible for you by giving suggestions or explicitly saying, will this element work? You'll have to go and take a look here and make sure you know what grade category you're using. So I might say, you have um, a two by six SPF number one, number two joist. Well, the only thing in there that you know anything about right now is look, number one, number two. And I said it was a two by six, meaning that it is 38 millimeters by 140 millimeters. We'll look at this, the smaller dimension of 38 and a larger dimension of 114, structural joist and plank. So my grade category for that thing I just rattled off is structural joist and plank. So that might be handy for us for the next series of slides I'm going to show you. So look, we have light framing, stud, structural light framing, structural joists and planks, beam and stringer, post and timber, plank decking. I'm going to tell you that the ones that we're going to use are right here. 
but let's take a look. These are our tables for strength and modulus of elasticity. Steel, we had 350 or 345 and 200,000 MPa. That was it. There was nothing else we needed to worry about. We knew what our steel strength was. It was a little bit lower if we hot rolled it, and we knew what our modulus of elasticity was. Wood has a wide variety of options. There's different types of trees, there's different grades of material, and then there's the different jobs that wood could be doing. So here, look at this. This is table 6.3.1a. So this is the first in four tables I'm gonna show you that look up strength and modulus of elasticity of wood. Here's our species identification. So Douglas fir, hem fir, SPF, or spruce pine fir, or northern, which is our cedar. Then we have the grade of lumber. So select structural, number one, number two, number three, or stud. This is a visual grading process. It is literally the wood goes down a conveyor belt and somebody goes good, medium, bad, bad, good, medium. At least that's how it started. Now they have a machine that looks at it, that visually grades it um, to go along with it, but it is following the guidelines of the visual grading process. It is by looking at the outside of the material. So select structural is going to be beautiful, barely a knot in it, no imperfections, a gorgeous piece of material. You can imagine that if you take out imperfections, your strength goes up. So as much as it looks the nicest, it's usually the strongest of that material. So look, Douglas fir larch, select structural, which is the best looking. For bending of wood, it's got 16.5 MPa capacity. Remember our steel was 350, so it's much less. But number three, number stud, which is the worst visual grading we can give our material, is only 4.6. So it is a quarter of the capacity of the select structural. So this process of looking at the wood tells us if it's good or not. You do not have to visually grade wood. I would tell you what grade of wood you are using. Look at this, bending at extreme fiber. Remember when we were talking about that bending process for elastic bending, we cared about the stress at the top fiber and the bottom fiber, or bending at the extreme fiber. In steel, sometimes we would allow that yielding to come all the way down to the neutral axes. Wood is brittle. When it gets to the end of the elastic zone, it fails. So once we hit the maximum stress at the top of the piece of wood and the bottom of the piece of wood, that's it. We don't get to make use of any plastic behavior because it doesn't have any plastic behavior. So we have our stress, maximum stress for bending of wood we have four different species types, and in those we have three different grade types. So that gives us three, six, nine, twelve different possible bending stresses. We have longitudinal shear, or FV. We have parallel to grain compression. That is saying that we have all of our straws like this in our wood, and we are talking, ow, maybe I won't put the pencil in that group. We are talking about compression parallel to grain. We are pushing on this in the same direction the straws run. So our load, if we were drawing our load arrow to represent that load, it is going in the same direction as the straws. So compression parallel to grain. Again, we've got different values depending on what type of wood it is and what grade of wood it is. Compression per to grain or perpendicular to grain is saying that we are pushing on it this way. So we're squishing it this way. You can imagine that's important if we're setting another piece of wood down on something. 
We're not going to be worrying about that. We're going to be worrying about bending at the extreme fiber and compression parallel to grain. And we'll touch on shear. We're not going to do anything with tension, but you can see that wood has different values in tension. Wood does not behave as well in tension as it does in compression. Steel, we had this whole table here was just replaced with 350 MPa. That's it. If it was a hot rolled section, maybe it was 345. But all of these numbers were replaced with one number for steel. Steel also had a modulus of elasticity of 200,000 MPa. Wood also varies. So how stiff the wood is varies as well. So we have different modulus of elasticity based on the species identification and the grade. It always bugs me that they have these two different modulus of elasticity. They could have just built a factor into the calculation, but sometimes they have E05. And that's really saying it is the, it eliminates the the five percent uh, probability yeah. because of the strike requirement, yeah. as opposed to the, the, the uh, median. So instead of taking an average, we are taking the five percent probability of these pieces of wood. So that means we're um, we're lowering, or we're we're taking a lower portion on our. So you can imagine they've taken a bunch of these pieces of wood and tested them. Some of them were really weak. Some of them were really strong, and most of them are somewhere in the middle, which means you have a bell curve of some sort. And instead of taking somewhere in the middle, or this range right here, we're taking somewhere closer to the lower end, with a 5% probability. Because we don't want to get cocky and say, oh, most of the time the wood's pretty good. Um, for strength, we're going to take the lower value, because we don't want to risk it. Remember, it's life safety when we're talking about strength. Stiffness, we don't care as much about. Remember, that's just about preservation of finishes. So when we talk about stiffness, and we'll get more into that next week when we're talking about bending, we will use this modulus of elasticity. So these are related to each other. They come from the same graph that you never need to see. But if we're talking about strength, we're going to pull off the E05 value. Here's the easy part. The equation will say use E05. So you can just use this E right here when it says to use this E. You don't see the E05? Huh? You're coming over and using this E. Look at this. Here's another strength and modulus table. Table B. So all the same stuff we had before, but for grade uh, construction and standard. We're not going to use this table because we are not going to do construction and standard grade of uh, lumber. These are machine graded lumbers. We are not using that. We're only using the visual grading system, which is our select structural, number one, number two, number three, and stud grade lumber. Here's one that might be handy for us. Beam and stringer grades. So let's go back a second. This was the very first one. This is A. Structural joist and plank, structural light framing, and stud grade categories of lumber. Remember that I just threw out a random uh, size. I said a 2 by 6 uh, SPF, number 1, number 2. Well, we saw that it was a structural joist and plank um, grading um, uh, or grouping species grade. So structural joist and plank is this table. This table is for our beams and stringer grades. And this table, D, is for our post and timber grades. So to know which table you're using, A, B, C, or D, let's go back a few slides. You're getting that from this table. You know what your dimensions are of your lumber, and you know what grade the material is, you can figure out your grade category. And this tells you whether you're using table A, B, C, or D. I've told you we're not going to use B at all. So for you, it's are we using table A, C, or D. 
So let's talk about our first factor now. Let's talk about our load duration factor. So the load duration factor is essentially about the tendency for the material to creep. Um, if we have a long-term load on our material, it will tend to creep and we lower the strength of our material so that we build in a bit of a buffer for that long-term loading condition. Short term, if it's a really quick loading, well, we get to say that probably the strength will be even higher because the odds of it having any long-term creep issues are low. But most of our loads are standard term. So let's read the standard term clause for our load duration factor KD. Standard term means the condition of loading where the duration of specified loads exceeds that of short term loading. And short term loading is wind, earthquake, false work, form work, uh, but is less than long term loading. So if you're normal, you're not short and you're not long. Uh, examples, so this is the important part. Examples include snow loads, which is a normal load, live loads, which are a normal load. Uh, we're not doing wheeled loads, but wheel loads, but look at this. And dead load when it's in combination with the above. You guys remember back when we looked at load combinations? It was rare that dead load by itself would govern the design case. We would have to worry about it because it changes our wood capacity somewhat, so we have to do a second check, but we're not gonna get into that here. For us, everything is going to be a standard term. Unless I explicitly told you otherwise, unless I said the words to you, this is a long-term loading condition, you're going to use standard term. This is the one we are going to be using unless I explicitly tell you otherwise. System factor. So system factor, and I feel like I should have a piece of paper here to draw you guys a little cartoon sketch. So system factor, first off, if there's no system, it does not mean your factor is zero. If there is no system, your factor is one. So if you know nothing else, use one. That's gonna be your safe conservative spot. There are two conditions for, Kate for, for system factors, case one and case two. Let's take a look at why we have this. So I have I have three joists at 16 inches center to center. And I stand on the middle joist. Only this joist is going to move. That is not part of the system. What if we put something, if these, if these elements were close enough together, what if we tied them together just a little bit? So I haven't, I'm standing in the same spot with all of my weight above the same joist. When this joist tries to deflect, it takes the plywood with it. So the plywood goes down, but the plywood is being held up by these two joists, or else the plywood is trying to pull down on those two joists just a little bit. That means by the effect of this joist in the middle being so close to the ones beside it, and having something tie them together here, continuous, we are making just the tiniest little bit of use of the two members on either side of it. That is a system. You okay? Yeah. Okay. That works if we're standing on a joist or if a stud has a wall against it. Remember, we put plywood on the outside of our wall as well. So a system occurs when we have joists with plywood on it and studs with plywood on it, which is most of our housing construction for joists and studs. So studs and joists are often part of a system. 
let's take a look at what that clause actually says. So uh, case one is members can't be spaced more than 610 apart. Well, remember we're often uh, uh, 16 inches apart, which is about 400 millimeters apart. Um, they're arranged so that they mutually support the applied load. Um, it applies to systems closely spaced, such as trusses, uh, glue laminated timbers, um, it may apply to conventional joists and rafter systems where the detailings do not meet this clause because this is the one that we use the majority of the time. They have to be uh, close together, so we still need to meet that 610 requirement, which we do, and the joists, rafters, or studs are sheathed with plywood, a minimum of 9.5 millimeters thick. Remember I said we often use at least half an inch sometimes three quarters of an inch. So we meet that no problem. Um, and then there's some requirements on how often we nail it and screw it. But what I can tell you is that's just how we build stuff. This is the norm of how we build things. So if we're talking about a normal house with plywood on it, a joists or studs with plywood on it, we're probably talking about case two here. So if I tell you it's a normal kind of house and it's a stud or a joist, you're talking about a case two here. Let's go back to the table for that. So here was that system factor KH. Remember, it's not part of the system. It's KH is one, which means it's not part of a system. And then they have case one here and case two here. Don't worry about this over here. Um, our built-up beams often aren't going to be part of it uh, because it's hard to meet that 610 requirement. Um, and they've got bending, shear, and compression parallel to grain for our visually graded case one or case two lumber. I said we're gonna be talking about visually graded. I said that if it's a joist or a stud, it's gonna be case two. So you can start to pull off what KH is. Service condition factor. So this is, is our member outside essentially. So if it's a dry service condition, which means inside the envelope of our building, it's got a KS of one because it's gonna be dry. It's being protected from the environment by plywood, which has a membrane on it, um, and all kinds of things to keep that dry. And look, you can see that there's a different KS depending on whether we're talking about bending, shear, compression, or even our modulus of elasticity has a KSE or a KS value. So we can modify a modulus of elasticity. But if it's dry, it's always going to be one. Wet service conditions is when we're outside um, so that would be uh, a deck, any wood that's exposed to the elements that doesn't have something to protect it. Um, pools uh, that have a wood deck for the roof, um, the moisture requirements or the, the, the pool, uh, the pools are often at almost 100% humidity in those rooms, meaning we would consider it a wet service condition. It still usually often makes it a better choice um, in that wet environment because the steel tends to rust a little bit. Um, so you would just need to remember to build in this service condition for your material if it is exposed to weather. KT is the treatment factor. So the treatment factor, if it is an untreated piece of lumber and it is dry or wet, our KT factor is one. Um, uh, preservative treated unincised lumber. So a preservative in treatment is our, um, our pressure treated lumber. So that's where we push this um, treatment to protect our lumber from rot into the material. If it is unincised, it is one, whether it's dry or wet. And so here, let's take a look at what incised means. So when we're talking about pressure treating lumber. If this is our piece of lumber right here, when they pressure treat it, 
if you cut that piece of lumber, you will see, so if I went and cut that piece of lumber, I would see that the treatment has gone in some amount to the material. It doesn't go all the way into the core. It's why when we cut members that are pressure treated, we often have um, end coat or end cut or a sealant sitting beside us that you just brush on with a paintbrush to apply that protective thing to the end of the, uh, the exposed piece of lumber as well. Because here, it's just regular old SPF. The green zone is our SPF that has a, a treatment in it to prevent it from rotting. Incised is basically they come along and put a bunch of staple holes almost in our material. You can often see it because it looks literally like somebody put a series of staplers all over the outside of the material and pulled it away. So what they've done then is added a whole bunch of holes to it which allows now that treatment to come in much further. So now we've got that treatment deeper into the material. But, so we've protected it more from the weather, which is great, but we've poked a bunch of holes in it, which lowers its capacity somewhat. So that's why preservative treated incised lumber has a reduction due to its treatment factor. It's not the treatment that's the problem, it's the fact that we've poked a bunch of holes in it that is the problem. Fire retardant treat, fire retardant treated lumber, I can honestly say I have never done this. Have you have you done a fire retardant treatment on your lumber? Oh, you've always. never you've never done it either. I have a friend who did her uh, masters on this. I have never had it applied in anything I've done. Um, I'm not saying it's not important, and when it's used that it's not crazy important. I just have never used it myself, and he's designed like a hundred times, he's old, he's designed like a hundred times more things than me, uh, and he hasn't done it. Mostly he's exposed to more because his company is so big. Um, but uh, neither of us have ever made use of the fire retarded treatment for lumber. Basically, we're not going to worry about it in this class. So size factor. What we're saying with the size factor, and it's kind of kind of intuitive, it's not intuitive. You would think that the bigger it gets, the better. What we're saying is the bigger the element gets, the odds of there being a hidden knot that we can't see in our visual grading process goes up. Remember, all we can look at is the outside surface of the member. So if we've got a member that, that's this big, well, we can probably see most of it. And if there was a knot, it would be cut through on one of those four sides and we'd be able to say, oh, that shouldn't be graded very high because there's a flaw on it. As it gets bigger, that knot could be fully hidden inside the piece of lumber and we don't know about it. It's not gonna get caught, cut open, but now there's an internal flaw inside our piece of lumber. And the bigger it gets, the statistical probability of that flaw being in there goes up. So we deal with it by reducing the capacity of the stress. We lower the strength of our member by applying this factor. If it's really a small piece of lumber, well, we would know if there was any flaws in it easily. So uh, we actually get to increase the capacity of our lumber. So here's our compression. Those were all the factors that we had to worry about, except for one that pesky buckling factor. We're gonna talk about it in just a minute. Here is the compression design equation. PR equals our reduction factor for compression, capital FC. When we know this little C often means compression, we often know when we see an F here that we're talking about stress, but it's always in steel it was a lowercase fy because we were talking about yielding. This is C for compression in wood, but this little uppercase. Let's get to that in a second. A is area, no problem. KZC, we, we know is a size factor. Actually, let's go back one slide here. 
<clears throat> this was bending and shear. We're going to be today talking about compression parallel to grain. So compression parallel to grain, KZ sub C. Value computed using formula in clause 6.5.6.2.3. That's a lot of points. Uh, I am going to give you that equation in the next slide. So KZC is the size factor that we have to calculate for things in compression. We'll look right here. We'll get down to that in a minute, but here I've given you that equation. And then KC, we don't know what that is. KC is going to be our slenderness factor. So let's go through these. This is our, resist, our reduction factor um, uh, for wood compression. Um, just want to... So our reduction factor, our resistance factor, the factor we put on the, the compressive resistance is 0.8. Everything we did for steel, whether it was compression or shear or bending, we were using a 0.9. Well, for our wood in compression, we use a 0.8. Here's the equation for our capital FC. What it really is, is our lowercase fc, where the maximum stress we want to see in our column in compression, and that comes from those strength tables that we saw first, yeah. Yeah. multiplied by all of our factors, our load duration factor, uh, our, um, uh, our, our size factor, our treatment factor, and H is ah, our system factor. So, duration factor, system factor, size factor, treatment factor. Those are all simple things that we will know about based on the material. So this looks overwhelming, but when you break it down element by element, it starts to get a little bit easier. Oh, look at that. KD is our duration factor. KH is our system factor. KSC is our service condition factor for compression. And KT is our treatment factor. A is our cross-sectional area, or B times D for a rectangular section. That's pretty easy. That's our shape factor, or our shape property. Um, our shape property for compression is area. KZC is that, um, that size factor. So the size factor, if it was in bending or shear, we got to just look it up from a chart. But if it was in compression, we had to calculate it. Now, in our steel equation, we had lambda, that lambda portion of our equation, where it was 1 plus lambda to something, and then all of that was to the power of minus 1 divided by n. We'll look at this. We'll, we'll, we'll break down what the actual elements are in it in a second, but 1 plus a bunch of stuff inside brackets to the minus 1. So it's very similar to the slenderness factor we had for steel. Basically what you had was a bunch of smart people over here developing your steel equation. You had a bunch of smart people over here developing your wood equation. They weren't working together. They were both developing their equations, so they looked different. They were different fields of study. but. They look very similar anyway. They both are in the brackets to the power of minus one something, and they're a one plus a series of factors, or a series of elements. Let's take a look here. It is one plus capital FC. Well, we have already would have figured out what capital FC was. KZC, which is our size factor. Uh, CC. CC, we haven't talked about yet, but it is similar to that KL divided by R. Remember in steel, we had our KL divided by R factor that we needed to worry about? Well, C, C is basically that, just worked out a different way. They've built it into the equation by length divided by the dimension. I'm gonna come back to these in just a second. That is cubed. 35 is a constant, E05. 
Well, this is within our strength equation, so we don't use uh, our, 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 the one that we would use for designing beams in bending for stiffness, but it is the stiffness factor or the modulus of elasticity for our lumber, but the 5% probability value. Uh, KSE is the um, size factor, but for modulus of elasticity. And then KT is our treatment factor. So most of these are things we would have already pulled from the table. This we would have already calculated. Uh, this we would have already calculated. This we pull from a table. This we pull from a table. And this we pull from a table. Let's look at KZC and CC. I have two versions of these here. So look at this, 6.3 times the depth times the length related to the depth or the length in that direction. And then here we have LB divided by B or LD divided by D. This is important. We have our rectangular shape here. We often call the short side B and the long side D, even though we're talking about compression. We talked about buckling lengths. If we have just this regular element here, we have two different dimensions and it is unbraced in both directions. So its length is its full height, no matter what side we're talking about. And so when we try to squash it, it buckles in the weak axes because it is the smaller dimension. So it tries to buckle that way. We understood that very easily for steel. You guys also remember that last week or two weeks ago, I got Dave just to put his finger here. Look at this. It's a lot harder for me to get this to buckle now. It's trying to buckle in this zone but it's a lot harder. So the unbraced length in my weak axis direction, or the direction of B, went from being this full length to only half of the length. So the unbraced length is this length in this direction. But look, I'm only holding my finger here. I'm not holding it here. So I'm only holding my finger here. In this direction, the length stays the same. What happens if I try to squash this thing and I brace right here? So I've cut my unbraced length in D in half, but my unbraced length in the weak axis stays the same. Well, by putting this here, it doesn't do much. It still tries to buckle in the weak axis. This is very important in wood because we'll often screw wood to plywood or we'll put blocking in the element. So we only have it trying to buckle in one direction. And the direction it tries to buckle might not be the weak axis direction. So we have to stop and essentially do the equation twice. We need to know which direction is going to cause it to buckle. Strength is easy. We know that strength is just the reduction factor times the, the maximum stress we want to see times the area. That's how strong it is for squashing. But for buckling, if it is braced at different heights in different directions, it isn't obvious to us which direction it's going to try to buckle based on its dimension. So we have to check both. In steel, if it wasn't braced, its unbraced length was often its whole height in either direction. So it was easy to know that it was going to buckle in the weak axes. So we have um, B and D, and then we have the effective length associated with the width and depth, respectively, or the unbraced length in each direction. And then we have to calculate CC for both the B direction, the weak axis direction, and the strong direction. And since we'll have to do this calculation twice, we'll want to calculate the size factor for each of those directions. Here's what I really want you to see. This is the equation, and we know that this KC ha is really one plus um, some, uh, some strength stuff times a few other things divided by 335E. 
So it looks very similar to lambda, but look at this. They both have a reduction factor. They're both talking about the maximum stress we want to see. They both have area. And then this has some factors, including a buckling factor. And then this is all about a buckling factor. So if you break it down to its essence, both of these equations are strength, or a reduction factor, times the maximum stress we want to see, times the area, plus or including some factors and buckling. Steel, the factors are pretty easy and it's just the buckling one. Wood, we have to build in some factors for the fact that it rots and it shrinks and a few other things. But the core of both of these different complicated equations is the exact same. They're both built off of this basic premise. They look different because these people were developing it over here and these people were developing it over here. But as you write it out, you see that they are actually very similar equations. Here is an element that I have plotted out uh, the compressive resistance um, uh, based on its unbraced length. Um, uh, so at different unbraced lengths, the, the actual compressive resistance, PR, is plotted here in red. If you just think about strength, which is the reduction factor, times the maximum stress we want to see, times the area, or the squashing, here is our capacity. Nowhere in that does length come into play, or how tall it is. So that's the maximum that we could see. When we have a really short element, it's really hard to make it buckle. So this is the critical load at which it would buckle, and it kind of goes off the chart. That keeps going to infinity as it approaches a length of zero. So as it gets shorter and shorter and shorter, the odds of it buckling are almost eliminated. It would be impossible to get it to buckle. The actual equation is a combination of those two. When our column is really, really, really short, it doesn't buckle at all, and it's governed by squashing. As it gets really tall, strength has almost nothing to do with it, and it's all about its tendency to buckle. Now, right here is where we have a limit on CC. Now remember I said CC was very similar to that KL divided by R uh, element within steel, and there was a limit of 200 on that. And after that, it didn't matter what the capacity we calculated was. We said, it's so slender, we don't trust it. You just have no capacity after that height. Well, CC has an upper limit of 50, and that is essentially what we're saying here, that after this point right here, if you actually calculated this value right here, somewhere here it would drop down to zero. Uh, we're saying that after this height right here, we don't care at all that we might have actually calculated that it's got a capacity right around here. It is so close to zero and it is so slender, we don't trust it at all. We're saying that its capacity is zero. It's got no capacity whatsoever. So this looks almost identical to the steel version of this chart. I personally think the best way to talk about this now is to go through and do some examples. I will go through and do three separate examples with you. And in the assignment, you have two more that next week you will get the full worked out values for. So you will have access at your disposal to five fully worked out examples of wood compression. So I'm going to stop the recording and flip to my uh, aiming down mode. So let's take a look at our first compression example. So they've said, determine the capacity of an 89 by 89 wood post that's 2.5 meters long in an interior environment. The wood is SPF, number two, untreated. So we need to figure out what the compressive capacity is, or PR. Why they write wood with PR is very annoying. Uh, it's the same as our compression resistance. It's the exact same thing. 
um, but we need to find out what that capacity is, that reduced capacity of this post. Somebody wants to know if uh, what load they can possibly put on this post. So we need to figure out a few things about this piece of wood. So we have um, an 89 by 89 wood post that's 2.5 meters long. Let's start to go back to our different factors. Let's, let's flip all the way back here. The very first thing I said you often need to do is to figure out what grade category you're in. So we have an 89 by 89 SPF number two post. So they break this down by saying what's the smaller dimension, what's the larger dimension, and what grade is it? And that will give you your grade category. Remember the grade category is what tells you whether you're using table A, C, or D. So smaller dimension, we are 89 by 89. So it looks like we fit this. Uh, our larger dimension is 89, but look, it's a construction or standard grade. That's not the grade of material we have. A stud is 89 or 30 and 38 or more, but we do not have a stud grade. Smaller grade of 89 with a larger dimension of 89, that meets our criteria. And look, the grade possibilities are select structural, number one, number two, or number three. Well, we are an 89 by 89 number two piece of lumber. So that means our grade category is structural light framing. So now we have to see which of those tables is for structural light framing. Well, table A is for structural joist and plank and structural light framing and, and also stud grade categories of lumber. So that's us. That's what we need. They told us we were using SPF, or spruce pine fir, and a number two grade of lumber. So now we know that anything we need is going to come from this line right here. We're talking about compression, where a force parallel to all the little strands of cells in that uh, piece of lumber. So number one, number two, for compression parallel to grain. It looks like we're going to be using this number right here. So we're going to want, we know that the maximum stress this post can see is 11.5 MPa. We know that we'll probably also need to know what E05 is, and that's 6,500. So let's start writing down these things that we know about our piece of lumber. So we have, we want to know, we want to know what PR is for an 89 by 89 post with a height of 2.5 meters and they've said it's SPF number two, and that it's dry and inside. So what we know, so what we know, let's talk about what we know about the fact that it's wood and what we know about the wood. So about the wood, we do know what the reduction factor is. I told you that the reduction factor for wood and compression is 0.8. Grading, the grading category, we just looked that up and we saw that it was structural light framing. We also saw then from table A that FC, a lowercase f, C, was 11.5 MPa, or the maximum stress we wanted that lumber to see is 11.5, prior to putting any factors onto it. And we also looked up EO5, 
and it was 6,500 MPa. So now we need to figure out all of our wood factors. Let's figure out these wood factors now. I'm going to make the calculation screen a little bit smaller. We know that we have several factors that we need to figure out what they are. Let's go to the first one. First one is the load duration factor. Well, they haven't said anything odd about this element, and I told you that unless you were talking about something unusual, it's almost always going to be at the standard term factor. If it wasn't, I would have told you explicitly that it was long term or short term. Because even though short term could be wind or earthquake or something else, if it's combined with dead load, it can be a standard term load. So we know that KD should be 1. System factor factor. I, I guess the system factor factor. <laughs> the system factor. Maybe I'll update that. Um, the system factor, if it's not part of a system, the KH is 1. Now, they said that this was a post. They didn't say anything about it being a stud or a joist. And we only get to take this into account if there was other things nearby that were also being loaded through the same object. So we're standing on the plywood that's connected to the joist. That sounds to me like this post is not part of a system. It doesn't seem like a stud or a joist. Remember, studs and joists are often a two-by material at 16 inches on center. And this doesn't seem to be something like that. So there's no system, which means our KH would be 1. The service condition factor. They said it was an interior environment. So... That means it's a dry service condition, and dry service condition, everything is 1. So for Ks, or our service condition factor for compression, compression parallel to grain, is 1. And our service condition factor for modulus of elasticity, also 1. The last factor that we can look up on a chart is our treatment factor. Um, uh, or and the treatment factor is different for dry or wet service conditions. But we had untreated lumber. There's no reason to put any treatment on a piece of lumber that's inside. They explicitly told us it was untreated, but intuitively you should know that if it's interior environment, we wouldn't really bother treating the lumber. So whether it's dry or wet service condition, KT is 1. We happen to be a dry service condition. So our treatment factor is 1. The last factor is size factor, but we're talking about compression parallel to grain, and so the size factor is something we have to calculate then. So let's write down all of these factors now that we've looked them up. We looked up KD, or the load duration factor, and saw that it was 1. We looked up the system factor, and it's not part of a system, so the factor is 1. We looked up the service condition factor for compression, and it was 1, as was the service condition factor for modulus of elasticity. And then we also looked up the treatment factor, and it was also 1. So all of the factors for this post are 1. That makes life pretty easy. Let's write what we know about the member. We know that depth is 89 millimeters. We know that the width is 89 millimeters. Basically, they're saying that this is a 4x4 four four post. 4x4. Four four. And 4x4, four four, which is really four inches by four inches, isn't really four inches by four inches. It's three and a half inches by three and a half inches, or 89 millimeters by 89 millimeters. LD and LB. 
we know that it could be braced at different spots in each direction, and that could have an impact, even more so if we had different dimensions in two different directions. But they didn't say anything about this being braced. Posts could be in a wall, but it seems unlikely that they would have put this post in a wall. We're not sure of the condition. They've told us, they haven't told us enough information on that. So we'll have to assume that uh, the full length of it is unbraced in both directions. So it's unbraced length in both directions is two meters. D equals B and LD equals LB, that seems that for anything that is direction related, the value is going to be the same in either direction. We can keep track of that if we want, but it's nice to know. So let's start breaking down our compression equation. Let's take a look at our equations here. We know that the compressive resistance equation for wood is our compression reduction factor, our capital FC, which is the maximum stress with all the forces or all of the factors incorporated, the area times KZC, which is our size factor and then Kc, which is our slenderness factor, or the buckling factor. This is something that if we were in bending, we could look up from a chart, but we're talking about compression, so it's something we have to calculate. Well, the reduction factor for wood, we've already written down up here. Uh, we haven't calculated Fc, capital Fc, so let's write down that equation. Capital FC equals lowercase fc times kd times kh times kfc times kt. Well, for us, we've already looked up what fc was. It was the maximum stress that we wanted to see, or 11.5 times, and then we've already looked up KD, KH, KSC, and KT right here. Or 1 times 1 times 1 times 1. So capital FC is 11.5 MPa. We haven't calculated area, but area is B times D, or 89 times 89. Let's take a look. 89 times 89 equals 7,921 millimeters squared. KZC is the next thing we need to know. And we know that it is 6.3 times DLD to the minus 0 0.13 or 6.3 D, or sorry, BLB minus 0 0.3. We don't know which one it is because it depends. It has to be calculated in conjunction with the appropriate uh, buckling length. So we have to check both of these and keep track of it to apply to our buckling length. But for us, D equals B and LD equals LB. So it's the exact same value for us. Or 6.3 times 89 times 2,500 to the minus 0 0.13. We can plug that into our calculator. 6.3 times 89 times 2,500 to the minus 0.13 gives us 1.271.
Now, if you guys remember, it had to be less than 1.3. There was an upper bound on that. Anything greater than that for the size factor it was limited by 1.3. Let's go back and just take a look at that equation for ourselves here. You can see that we had an upper bound of 1.3. We're less than 1.3. So basically what we're saying is our member is small enough that the odds of a knot being hidden inside it that we can't see is very low. So we're going to increase the strength of it. We think we're going to use a higher value here. So that's KZC. The next thing we have to calculate is KC. Now KC is the messy one. This is the one that is like lambda in our steel equation. So it equals 1.0 plus capital FC KZC CC cubed divided by 35 EO5 K S E K T. That's in a bracket, and then all of that's in a bracket to the minus one. Well, we've already calculated capital F C. Uh, we calculated that right here. It's 11.5. K Z C, we've calculated, and it's the same in both directions. We've looked up EO5, we've looked up KSE, and we've looked up KT. The only thing we don't have is CC. So it looks like we need to figure out CC now. CC was either LD divided by D or LB divided by B depending on which direction we were checking. Well, LD equals LB and D equals B, so for us these are the same. 2,500 divided by 89. 2,500 divided by 89 gives us 28.09. There's an upper bound on that of 50, but we're below 50, so we're okay. Well, now it looks like we have everything that we can plug into this equation. KC equals 1 plus capital FC was 11.5 times KZC, we calculated that to be 1.271 times CC, which is 28.09 cubed, I always forget to write the cubed there, divided by 35 times our EO5, or our modulus of elasticity, the 5% probability modulus elasticity, is 6,500 times KSE, or our service condition factor for modulus of elasticity, but it was 1, and KT was 1. And all of this is to the minus 1. So now it's about plugging this into our calculator. Should we brave it, do it all in one go here? I'm going to try to make sure you can see this. All right brackets, one plus bracket. I'm going to do another bracket. 11.5 times 1.271 times 28.09 cubed, and bracket, divide by 35 times 6,500 times 1 times 1, end bracket. That whole thing ends bracket and then that whole thing ends bracket all to the minus one. And we get, let's make sure I plug this in right, woohoo, look at me go, get 
0 0.4125. I kept some rounding versus the one you're going to see in uh, the calculation sheet. I think I kept an extra digit right here versus the one that was worked out there. We'll see that it'll have almost no impact here in just a minute. So now we've calculated Kc. It means we can go all the way back to our original equation, Pr, and plug it in. Our reduction factor is 0.8. Our capital FC is 11.5. Our area is 7,921 times our KZC, or our size factor, and it was the same in both directions, 1.271, times KC, which was 0 0.4125, and that's our buckling factor, and it was also the same in both directions. So remember, it's got KZC in here and CC in here. So if these had different, if if these two weren't the if these two weren't the same or these two weren't the same, we would have had to calculate this twice. We can plug this into our calculator. 0 0.8 times 11.5 times 7921 times 0.4125. Wait, what did I do here? I just plugged something in wrong. 0 0.8 times 11.5 times 7,921 times 1.271 times 0.4125, there we are, equals 38,207 newtons. Remember, once we get to this point, we like to write it in kilonewtons. PR equals 38.2 kilonewtons. And there is our answer. I often like to put a big box around the answer so that I know exactly what it is. Now, that's a pain in the ass. It seems like a 4x4 four by, a four by four post gets used all the time especially SPF, which is the most common material on the market, and a number two is pretty normal. I wonder if, like our steel, there are a series of charts for us. Let's take a look. I have provided for you a series of um, uh, compression tables for wood elements. So look at this. Here's our post selection table for sawn lumber. So that means two and four by material. And this is the factored compressive resistance per post. Factored means that the reduction factor has been applied. This is for an 89 by 89 post. Well, that's exactly what we have. They have the four different species groups here, and we have SPF. They have it for number one, number two. Remember, they, the value for um, uh, lowercase fc was the same for number one, number two, when we pulled it off the chart. And then they have a length here. They have ke equals one, which is really, these are those same drawings that I showed you for steel. We're going to be doing anything where we're not moment connecting the ends. So for a ke equals one, we had a length of 2.5 meters. So 2.5 meters for SPF number one, number two of an 89 by 89 post is 38.2, exactly what we calculated. Now, this is very, very, very handy. What if our element had been outside? All of a sudden, this might not be the same value. So you can see right here, standard term loading, dry service conditions, untreated lumber. This is where it's slightly less obvious with steel. The main difference that could have happened with steel 
would be that they changed up what grade of steel we were using, which doesn't happen very often. Like every 50 years, they change the grade of steel. Wood, whether we're building inside or outside, all of a sudden makes a big difference. What type of load is on it? We're always going to be using standard term loading. Is it treated or untreated? All of these things start to come into play. So this is a good guideline for you. And if you have standard term loading with dry service conditions and it's untreated lumber, it's the exact answer. But even if it's not these exact things, it's a good check to see if you're in the right range for your calculation. So let's go back to that equation here. So you can see here that I have it fully worked out for you step by step. It's exactly what I just did here on this piece of paper. And here it is pulled up from the chart for you so you can see it highlighted. Let's do another example. Let's take a look at a column that sees 105 kilonewtons of factored load. We want to know, does a 140 by 191 cedar select structural post work if it's 4.5 meters tall? Assume it's inside and untreated. Seems weird that they're using cedar inside. Maybe they just like the look of it because it, uh, it can get this nice silvery gray color when it's exposed or maybe they're reading it with the vernacular of the rest of the building. We don't know what their choice uh, system was here. And if we found something weird, we give them some feedback. Maybe cedar isn't the best choice inside because as much as it's good outside for rot, it has a lower strength than other materials. But that's feedback we can give them. They've asked us something very explicit here. And then they've said, if it doesn't work, could we brace the weak axis halfway up? And does that make it work? So let's go through that process now. And we're gonna start with the same thing we did last time. I'll get rid of this sheet of paper. And now we're going to look at this particular example. So we have PF equals 105 kilonewtons. They've told us what the load is on it. Remember, PF has to be less than PR. If it's more than that, our column will fail. We need a post that is stronger than this, with a reduced capacity greater than this. Does a 140 by 191 cedar select structural with a height of 4.5 meters work. It's inside and untreated. And if that doesn't work, if HB, if we braced it halfway up, so HB or the weak axis bending, they said if we braced it in the weak axes, does it work? Or if at 2.25, if the unbraced length in the weak axes was only 2.25. If it's helpful, I can draw a little diagram here of what we're talking about. Here's our post. Here is our applied load of PF equals 105. And we have in question one, the full length in both directions of bending is 4.5 meters. This is uh, our 140 dimension. And this is our 191 dimension. And what we're saying in the second question is that we're going to put a re reaction right here. We're going to brace that post in the weak axes there 
so that in the weak axes, it's 2.25 meters tall. So we have to go figure out all of our factors and what our uh, lowercase fc is and what grade category we're in. So let's go way back in our slides and we know we start at figuring out what grade category we have. So we have uh, a 140 by 191 post. Well look at this. Uh, these are all too small. The first one is a 114 or more. Well our smaller dimension is 140 so this seems to fit. Um, and the larger dimension exceeds the smaller dimension by more than 51. Well, we have 191 minus 140. That's exactly 51. It does not exceed the smaller dimension by more than 51. So that is not our grade category. The next one is a 114 or more. So we have 140. And does it exceed the smaller dimension by 151 or less? And it does, it was exactly 151. And we have a select structural grade. So it looks like we need to use the post and timber grade category. So this tells us which table we're going to use. A has structural joist and plank, structural light framing, and stud grade categories of lumber. It does not have our, uh, our post and timber grading category. Table B is all the construction and standard grade. I said we wouldn't be using that at all. Table C is for beam and stringer grades, so that doesn't apply to us. Table D is for post and timber grades, so it looks like this is the table we need to use. We have cedar, which we know falls into the northern category, and it's select structural. We're talking about something in compression, perpendicular or uh, parallel to the grain. So we have compression parallel to the grain. So our lowercase fc is 7.5. We know we also will need our modulus of elasticity at the 5% probability, or E05 is 5,500. So we can start writing in what we know. So what do we know for the wood? We know that our reduction factor is 0 0.8. We know that the grading is post and timber. And with that, we were able to determine that lowercase fc is 7.5 MPA. And we were able to look up the E05 as 5,500 MPA. The next thing we need to figure out is our wood factors. We know we need KD, KH, KSC, KSE, those are the service condition for compression and modulus of elasticity, and our treatment factor. Let's take a look at those tables for that. So the very first one is KD. There's nothing saying that it's a short-term or long-term duration, and I've told you that the norm is going to be standard. So it looks like KD is 1. System factor, it's a post. It is not something that is repeated every uh, 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 610 millimeters or less with plywood attached to it. 
So it's not part of a system, which means KH is 1. Service condition factor. They said it was inside and untreated. So it's a dry service condition. And we care about compression parallel to grain. So 1 for the service condition. And we care about modulus of elasticity service condition. It is also 1. And then the treatment factor. We have untreated lumber in a dry service condition, so we have a treatment factor of 1. We know that the size factor is one that we'll have to calculate ourselves. So it looks like all of our factors are 1, same as the last question. Don't worry, we'll do one with factors, but this is just to help show the difference of what direction uh, we're working with. I only want to change one thing at a time in these calculations so that you can see a few different variations happening. Let's talk about the member. Uh, D equals 191. B equals 140. LD equals 4,500, and LB equals, first they told us to check uh, if it was 4,500, but then they've said if you need to, well, maybe I'll try a better color there, that one looks just the same, then they've said try it uh, possibly if it was 2,000. 250 millimeters, if we need to. If this doesn't work, let's see what bracing it halfway up does. So let's start digging in to our different calculations. We know that we can calculate our area. In fact, I might as well calculate area right here. Area equals 191 by 140, and that doesn't change depending on what, what buckling direction we could possibly have. 191 by 140 equals 26,740 millimeters squared. We know that we'll need to calculate FC, and FC is lowercase FC times KD times KH times KSC times <coughs> excuse me times KT so we had we looked up 7.5 and then all of our factors were 1 or 7.5 MPA we know that we'll need to, fa to calculate CC in the B direction and CC in the D direction. So let's just go ahead and start calculating those. Might as well be very thorough about this. Um, CC in the B direction is uh, the length in the B direction divided by B, or 4,000. 500 divided by 140. And this is length in the D direction, or its ability to buckle in that direction, divided by D. Remember, that is saying that it could buckle in that direction versus buckling in that direction. So it's a lot harder to buckle in the strong direction. divided by 191. Let's calculate those. We've got 4,500 divided by 140, or 32.143. 4,500 divided by 191, or 23.560. Let's calculate K 
KZ uh, C in the in the B direction and KZ C in the D direction. Remember, this is that 6.3 times uh, B times the length in the B direction to the minus 0 0.13 or 6.3 times 140 times 191 to the minus 0 0.13. And this is going to be 6.3 times D times the length in the direction of buckling in that way to the minus 0 0.13 or 6.3 times, oh sorry, this shouldn't, that was supposed to be 4,500 and this is 191 times 4,500 to the minus 0 0.13. So let's plug those into our calculator. 6.3 times 140 times 4,500 to the minus 0.13, we get 1.110. The only thing that changed in this equation is instead of 140, it's 191. 1.066. Now we can calculate K C I'm gonna keep it in order, K C B and K C D. Remember, this is that pain in the butt equation that is similar to lambda, where we have big bracket. 1 plus bracket times um, times our capital FC times our KZCB. I'm not looking at the equation, I'm going from memory, and that's bound to screw us up, so give me just a second. Uh, sorry. KZCB times CC for the B direction cubed divided by 35 times EO5 times KSE times KT. And then that big bracket is to the minus 1. I'll calculate that down below. So let's actually put these numbers in. So we've got 1 plus 7.5 times our KZCB we just calculated as 1.110 times our CC in the B direction of buckling is 32.143 and that's cubed divided by 35 times our 5,500 for our modulus of elasticity times our factors of 1. So now I can plug this into my calculator. We've got a bracket of 1 plus 7.5 times 1.11 times 32.143 cubed divided by 35 times 5,500 times 1 times 1 end bracket, end bracket, also end bracket to the minus 1 and we get Sorry guys, let me just uh, want to verify that I'm not writing something crazy down. Perfect. We get 0 0.4105.
So this is for the tendency to buckle in the weak axes. We're also going to check it for its tendency to buckle in the strong axes. So the equation remains the same, except everywhere it was a B, it's going to be a D. So I'm going to plug the numbers right in here. We have 1 plus 7.5 times 1.066 times 23.56 cubed divided by 35 times 5,500 times 1 times 1 and that is to the minus 1. We can plug this into our calculator. <sighs> All right, 1 plus bracket, oops, bracket, 7.5 times 1.066 times 23.56 cubed, end bracket, divided by bracket, 35 times 5,500 times 1 times 1, end bracket, end bracket, end bracket, to the power of minus 1. And we get 0 0.6480. So that means we can calculate PR in the B direction and PR in the D direction. Or what is its capacity and its tendency, including its tendency to buckle in either direction? Remember, this equation is our reduction factor times our capital FC times our KZC, or our size factor. And for us, this is the size factor in B for this line. And KC, or our tendency to buckle, but in the weak axes. And down here, it's the exact same equation, except everywhere it's a B, it's a D, or its tendency to buckle in the strong axes. So we have 0 0.8 times 7.5 times our KZC in the B direction, or the weak axes, is 1.110 times our buckling factor in the weak axes is 0 0.4105. I'm going to plug in all the information. Uh, so KZCD here is the tendency to buckle, is the size factor and the tendency to buckle in the strong direction, or uh, 1.066 times the buckling factor So let's plug all of both of these into our uh, calculator. 0 0.8 times 7.5 times 1.10 times 0 0.4105. Sorry guys, I plugged something in funny there. Oh, you know what I forgot? Area and area. So times, that's a pretty big thing to forget, our, our 26,000 uh, 740. So P, R, B, and P, R, D. Let's plug these in again. 0 0.8 times 7.5 times 1.1 times 0 0.4105 times 26,740. And we get 72,447. I am... Oh. Wow, guys, bear with me today. I am having a hard time plugging things into my calculator. I forgot one of my ones. All right, 0 0.8 times 7.5 times 1.11 times... 
4105 times 26,740, and we get uh, 73,105. That's in newtons. I'm just going to write it straight down in kilonewtons. So that's dividing it by 1,000. I get 73.1 kilonewtons weak axes. Let's try the strong axes. So 0.8 times 7.5 times 1.066 times 0.6480 times 26,740. I'm going to divide by 1,000 so that I get it in newtons. I get 110.8 kilonewtons strong axes. Well, we need it to not fail. And to not fail, we need PR to be greater than PF. So we need these we need these to be greater than PF, which equals 105 kilonewtons. Well, Our strong axes buckling is greater. It works. But look at our weak axes. It is not strong enough. It wants to try to buckle in the weak axes, which makes sense. Everything was the same for these two, uh, except for its tendency to buckle. Intuitively, you probably knew you only needed to check it for its tendency to buckle in its weak axes. But I wanted to go through so that you could see the difference here. Now they said to us, if it doesn't work, does it help if we brace it halfway up in the weak axes? So this is the same thing as putting your finger here. Remember, it does not take much to stop it from buckling. So that means that everything is the same except our length in the weak axes, our unbraced length in the weak axes is 2.25 meters. So let's go through and see everything that that would impact. We'll have to recalculate CCB. We'll have to recalculate KZCB, which means we have to recalculate, and we also have to recalculate KCB. And then we get to recalculate PRB. So let's go through and see if that actually makes a difference. So for LB equals 2,250 millimeters instead, we've got CCB is now 2,250 divided by 140. So 2,250 divided by 140 is 16.071. Uh, we can recalculate um, KZCB, or 6.3 times 140 times 2,250 to the minus 0 0.13. 6.3 times 140 times 2,250 to the minus 0.13, we get 1.215. That is still less than 1.3, so we get to use uh, this factor. We still get to, wait, what am I? Yeah, yeah, so remember that had to be less than 1.3, and it is, so our size factor is still fine. Um, now we can calculate our slenderness factor or our buckling factor. So now we can calculate KZ or KCB or our buckling factor. And that is 1 plus 7.5 
times our KZCB, which we just calculated, of 1.215, times our CCB of 16.071 cubed, divided by 35, divided by 5,500, and our factors of 1. And then all of this is to the minus 1. We can plug this in, bracket, 1 plus bracket, bracket, 7.5 times 1.215 times 16.071 cubed divided by, oop, divided by 35 times 5,500 times 1 times 1, and that is all to the minus 1, and we get 0 0.8358 as our buckling factor. Now let's calculate what PR is in the weak axes if we brace it halfway up. We haven't changed anything in our strong axes, so this is still the capacity in the strong axes, and it works. Let's see what happens to our capacity if we brace it in the weak axes. Uh, we have 0 0.8 times 7.5 times our area of 26,740 times our size factor in the weak axes. So our size factor in the weak axes we calculated is 1.215. And we have our buckling factor, which we just ca calculated in our weak axes, or 0 0.8358. Let's calculate this out. 0 0.8 times 7.5 times 26,740 times 1.215 times 0.8358. And we get, I'm going to divide it by a thousand, so I'm writing it in kilonewtons right away. We get 162.9 kilonewtons of capacity. So it is greater than 105. So it works, and our PR in this case is 110.8 kilonewtons. Because both of these are true depending on the direction, which means the maximum load this could take is 110.8. So as long as we brace this post halfway up, it can take 105 kilonewtons of load. Dave? Yeah. In like two minutes, can you go relieve Jackie? Yeah. I have another example to go through. Yeah, no I'm very sorry. Thank no you. Sir. So let's take a look. You can see that worked out right here. You can see all of these values calculated out for you. So you have it here as well as what we just watched me do. So this is a direct, these are exactly the same. Let's do one more example. These ones were, I wanted to show you the effect of um, changing the buckling length in this one, but so far everything we've had has had pretty normal factors. Let's do one maybe with some factors on it. So do you guys remember from two weeks ago we had that canopy in Brampton? The dimensions were five meters by six meters, and the long side is being supported by the building, but over here we have two new columns. The height of the canopy was four meters, and the snow load in Brampton had an SS of 1.3 and SR of 0.4. So that was from the climatic data. They gave us a roofing assembly as well. So this is all information we had from two weeks ago. They said, let's consider the steel canopy uh, that we had two weeks ago. The contractor has suggested a cost savings by substituting wood members in lieu of steel. 
they're proposing the following. For a column, they want 140 by 140 Douglas fir number two. Assess whether the proposal is structurally adequate. Recall that this would be considered to be wet service conditions. We'll worry about the beam next week. Here's the good part. We have already calculated all of our loads. We know what CF is, MF, VF, and what our serviceability load conditions are. These are things we calculated last week, or I guess if you count spring break. So let's go through and do this column accordingly. This is the last one. Hopefully it gives you lots of examples to work from. It's 428, Dave. Do you, do you need me to stop? No. Okay. Okay, so we have a 140 by 140 Douglas fir number two post. We know that CF equals 23.3 kilonewtons. Where is he going? Nanny is done now. Um, sorry, it's very stressful. There are some serious deadlines happening on both of our parts and we are fighting for time to work. Um, that's about the most you'll ever hear us fight though. That, that, was, that was a blowout for us. Sorry about that guys. Sorry I had to witness that. Um, okay, so we've got, this is the post that we got right here and we know what's acting on it. We also know that its height is four meters. And we want to know if this post works or not. So let's go way, way, way back to the beginning here. The very first thing we know we need to do is figure out our grade category. We have a 140 by 140. Well, we can jump over all this. Both of these are uh, 114 or more. But same as the last time, uh, exceeds smaller dimension by more than 51. Well, they're equal, so it doesn't have that. Exceeds smaller dimension by 51 or less. It exceeds it by zero, so that's perfect. Uh, we have a Douglas fir number two, so the grade works here. We are again talking about a post and timber category. So let's go to the post and timber category here. We have a Douglas fir number two, compression parallel to the grain is 7.5, and a modulus of elasticity, 5% uh, probability of 6,000. So we have a little bit of information we can start writing down now. We have a reduction factor of 0 0.8, we know that. We know that the grading is post and timber. And we've just looked up that the lowercase maximum stress we can see prior to adding any factors is 7.5 MPA and that the modulus of elasticity is 6,000 MPA. We know that the next thing we need to figure out is all our factors. What is KD? What is KH? What is KSC? What is KSE? And KT. All of our other examples, these were one for everything. Let's take a look. Now I'm going to tell you that you got, oh, I'll get to that in just a second. All right, load duration. Nothing in here that says it's unusual, so our load duration factor is going to be one. It's a post, it's not part of a system, so it's KH is one. You guys are going to do in your assignment a question where it is part of a system. 
and you are going to be looking at a case two of compression parallel to grain, where it would be 1.1. But for us, we have a KH of 1. Service condition factor, or KS. We have a wet service condition. We have the least dimension is over 89 millimeters, so it seems like this is the table that we have to pull from. Compression parallel to grain, 0.91 and modulus of elasticity, 1. So we have our first factor that isn't 1 here. Treatment factor. Everything OK? Dave? Wow. Uh, treatment factor. Um, we have an untreated piece of lumber. Um, it's outside, doesn't seem that smart to have untreated lumber outside, but it's, it's Douglas fir, maybe it's not gonna do too bad. Maybe they're willing to take a risk. But also, look, uh, it doesn't seem to give us any problems for our strength. So we have a wet service condition, it's still one here. We can fill in our, uh, our factors here. So KD, or our uh, load duration factor, we saw is still 1. It's not part of a system, so our factor is 1. We did have our first factor here that is less than 1. Our service condition for compression parallel to grain, 0.91. Service factor for modulus of elasticity is 1, and our treatment factor is also 1. Let's write everything we know about the material, or about the member size. We know that D is 140 millimeters. We know that B is 140 millimeters. Our length is 4,000 in both directions. There's nothing bracing this. It is the post for a canopy. So there's nothing to assume that it would brace it. Bonus for us is D equals B and LD equals LB. So it looks like we'll only need to ch worry about buckling in one direction because it would be the same in both directions here. Let's start going through our calculations then. PR is um, our reduction factor times capital FC times our area times KZC times KC. I'm not going to worry about B and D because we've established that this is going to behave the same in both directions here. And it's the same dimensions for everything in both directions. Well, we know our reduction factor, but we don't know capital FC here. It is lowercase fc times kd times kh times our service condition for compression parallel to grain times our treatment factor. Or for us, 7.5 times 1 times 1 times 0 0.91 times 1. So we have a different uh, capital FC from our FC. 7.5 times 0.91 is 6.825 MPA. So we have a lower strength here. Next thing is area. Area is B times D, or 140 times 140. Mommy's working, buddy. You're just getting a stool? Okay, buddy. Good job. 140 by 140 is 19,600. So we have our area. K KZC, or our size factor, is the next thing we need to calculate. 
is 6.3 times d l d to the zero point sorry minus zero point one three or b and l d or L, b and l b but they're the exact same for us so six point three times one forty times four thousand to the minus zero point one three 6.3 times 140 times 4,000 to the minus 0.13, and we get 1.1274. It is less than 1.3, so we're good. All right, we're getting somewhere. The next thing we have to calculate is uh, Kc. KC is 1 plus F, capital FC, KZC, CC cubed, divided by 35, EO5, KSE, KT. and that is to the minus one. We know all of this except our CC. CCB equals CCD, or uh, that is going to be 4,000 divided by 140. So 4,000 divided by 140 is 28.571. Now we have everything we need to calculate Kc, or our buckling factor, is 1 plus capital FC, we've calculated as 6.825. Times our size factor of 1.1274 times CC or 28.571 cubed divided by 35 times 6,000 times KSE, which was 1, times KT, which is 1, and all of this is to the minus 1. So this, whoa, this is our buckling factor. All right, big bracket, 1 plus bracket, no, 1 plus bracket, bracket 6.825 times 1.1274 times 28.571 cubed divided by 35 times 6,000 times 1 times 1 bracket 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 to the minus 1 equals 0.539 Now we can actually calculate PR. PR is our 0.8 times our 6.825 times our area, which is 19,600 times our size factor, which we calculated here is 1.1274 1 times our buckling factor, is 0.539. And we can calculate the capacity of this post. Or 0.8 times 6.825 times 19,600 times 1.1274 times 0.539. And we get a very large number, but that's in newtons, so I'm going to divide it by a thousand. 
and we get 65.0 kilonewtons. Let's take a look. PF equals 23.3 kilonewtons, and we need it to be less than PR, which we calculated equals 65 kilonewtons. Yes, it works. So the feedback we can give is that yes, this uh, 140 by 140 Douglas fir number two post will work to support this canopy. So let's, oh my kids are next level today. This is going to be, oh, they're throwing things at each other. <sighs> okay, we're almost done here, and I'm sorry you're having to hear this so far. It's been very lovely. Sometimes they're screaming. It's not the norm. So let's check against those wood compression tables. Let's see. I wish I could just remember offhand what, what page that was on. Uh... All right, so we have, this was an 89 by 89. Let's come down here and take a look. Let's go, let's flip through these pages. I normally put what, hope, what page I need to be on. Ah, here we are. We're in what we need to be now. Ooh, look. Douglas fir larch, number two, sawn lumber for a KL of one or a normal buckling. Uh, for a length of four meters for a size of 140 by 140, they have 68.4, and we calculated 65 kilonewtons. Can you think of what is different between the table and what we calculated? If you remember, this post was outside, which means that we had a wet service side. So we had to worry about the fact that it was outside. So that lowered the capacity of our member. So we had a, a factor that reduced it from that 64.8 just a little bit. And that's why we calculated the 65 kilonewtons. So let's go back to our slides here. So here it is, here it's pulled up. Let's just take a look. This was the, the steel column that we sized for it. And here's the wood post. Now, I'm going to acknowledge that already these numbers are bonkers different because wood is off the charts expensive right now. Normally, in a normal world, here's the weight per kilogram for these two things, and here's roughly the cost per meter we would have been looking at for these two things. So price-wise, you know, a year ago, these would have been pretty darn close to each other. The wood was heavier, um, so there's that to figure. And it was more expensive, but you know, these are all rough numbers anyway. We're not costing experts, we're doing, but we should have an idea of relative cost to each other. This number is higher right now because wood is, is, is nuts. But I just wanted to show you the visual comparison in size, so these are to scale, the weight comparison, and a rough cost comparison, just to show you some of the things that kind of need to be thought about to give feedback. Remember, the contractor was saying that the wood was a cost savings measure. So maybe we'd be like, you know what, this wood member works, and if you're sourcing it for cheaper than normal market values, that's great. But as the owner, the owner prefers steel, we should see that cost savings come back to us. If this is an aesthetic choice by the architect, well then maybe this is still a valid option. So let's talk about the takeaways on this. Um, you should know uh, that wood strength depends on the species. It's organic and has factors that impact its strength. And wood column design includes compression buckling. Wood comes in many forms, including engineered products. You should know how to choose your wood grade, know and determine the wood strength factors, 
how to calculate CR, which is PR, for columns, posts, and studs. You guys are going to do a stud one in your assignment. And you should know how to look up CR or PR, depending on what we're calling it, for available sections. And then you should know how to identify if the column works. Writing that PR is greater than PF and giving it a big old check mark, check mark is an important part of the process. So I apologize for all the drama with children today. Um, it's going to be a long night because we both still have hours we have to work ahead of us while managing angry little people today. I don't know what it is, but they are cranky and angry. Um, and we still have to sort out food and laundry and all the normal stuff. But it's all stuff that I know you guys are going through too, so this isn't me looking for sympathy. It's just to say, life is bonkers. Let me know if you guys need anything from me. So, have a good week, folks.